Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Institute of World Affairs, I'd like to welcome you here this evening. For those of you who don't have some chairs, I see several over on this side. Just to know before I introduce the speaker, we are out of brochures. Find a copy of the Daily tomorrow. We'll detail the remaining part of the program for the week. We would remind you we have a film tomorrow at noon. David Kunzel is speaking at 3 o'clock in the Pioneer Room on Art and Revolution in Nicaragua. And at 8 o'clock in the evening, Manuel Rodriguez Oranua, sorry my pronunciation isn't so good, will speak on Puerto Rico, Hawaii independence. The speaker we have tonight is a graduate of McMurray College, Stanford University Law School. He practiced law until 1979. Public interest law is associated with Ralph Nader. At that time, his career took a different turn. He turned to journalism, found himself working for the New York Times in El Salvador, Nicaragua. A variety of events occurred. He no longer works for the New York Times. He's author of a book, Weakness and Deceit, U.S. Policy in El Salvador. Please join me in welcoming Ray Bonner. Thanks, Rainer. I, I see that the uh, I'm supposed to be talking on U.S. policy and El Salvador this evening, but I'm sure you'll forgive me if I start out by uh, talking about Nicaragua, since that seems to be uh, occupying, if not preoccupying, uh, the news and our policymakers in Washington. Was, a week ago, I, I uh, addressed a nearby university. And that was the night when we were all asking, well, are they, aren't they, uh, the MiGs coming to Nicaragua? The MiGs, of course, didn't come, uh, but nevertheless, we now hear out of Washington that, uh, that um, Nicaragua is becoming a, an armed nation. There's a massive Soviet military buildup in Nicaragua, and therefore it's time for some very uh, serious response by the United States. Uh, yeah, is, are the Nicaraguans getting arms from uh, the Soviet Union? You bet they are. And they're probably going to get them any place else they can as well. At uh, some point further on this, this evening, we'll talk about who started the escalation. And I'll read for some State Department documents, which give some insights into that. But let's first start with why the Nicaraguans are arming themselves. I submit to you that it would be irresponsible for the president of any country, faced with what Nicaragua has faced, not to be arming itself, as the Nicaraguans are doing. We are at war against the Sandinistas, against the Nicaraguans. It's a little difficult to keep track of this one because, you see, normally it's the Defense Department and the Pentagon that wages our wars, but this one is being carried out by the CIA. But it is a war nonetheless. As many of you recall, it began in December of 1981, perhaps earlier, but at the moment, based on the documents we've been able to obtain, it began in December of 1981 when President Reagan signed what is called NSDD 17, that's National Security Decision Directive, it was number 17, authorized the CIA to spend uh, $21 million, $19 million in that range to establish a 500-man paramilitary force for the purpose of uh, introducing, interdicting the so-called supposed flow of arms from the Nicaraguans to the Salvadoran guerrillas. The, that has expanded that, that initial effort. We know, we've been able to count, that the CIA has spent at least $150 million. We know they've spent that much. The 500-man paramilitary force has grown. It's at least um, 15,000, according to most reliable intelligence estimates, in uh, fighting contras, freedom fighters, as the administration chooses to call them but fighting against the Nicaraguan government from bases in Honduras. Now, you may think, well, $150 million, 15,000 soldiers, that's not really very many, 15,000 guerrillas. But I think you have to put this in some kind of perspective and understand what this means uh, to the people of Nicaragua. It is the equivalent of 1.2 million Soviet-trained, Soviet-paid, and Soviet armed guerrillas attacking the United States from Canada and attacking from bases built by the Soviet Union in Canada and attacking with helicopters supplied to those guerrillas by the Soviet Union 
and small planes supplied by the Soviet Union. And already, the Soviet-trained, paid, and armed guerrillas would have blown up fuel depots in New England, grain silos and corn cribs and crops in Minnesota and Iowa, and would have attacked across the whole northern border of the United States, killing several thousand, in fact, probably the equivalent of 100,000 or 200,000 Americans in the last two and a half years. The Contras, these freedom fighters, have done at least $200 million worth of damage to the economy of Nicaragua. They've blown up bridges, port facilities, airports, power stations, oil pipelines and storage facilities, agricultural cooperatives, farms, schools, hospitals, and homes. And a substantial number of the victims have been civilians, not Sandinista soldiers. I was recently in, in Nicaragua, about six, seven weeks ago, I talked to a priest from a northern village. He said in the first two weeks, I believe it was in September, he had buried 14 people in his village that had been killed by the Contras, the freedom fighters. Women, children, school teachers, not soldiers. Also, while I was in Nicaragua, a health care worker came down from one of the northern villages near, near the border, and she came in for a meeting of health care workers in, in Managua. And she had a crude map that she had drawn, and on it she had circled in red eight health care facilities, rural health care facilities, that had been blown up by the Contras. And in blue, she had circled six other health care facilities that the government had closed because the Sandinistas could not provide the protection. As one doctor put it to me, the Contras are trying to destroy the very gains of the revolution. It's in light of that, it's faced with that war, that the Sandinistas have sought defensive weapons. And they have been called defensive weapons by many in the United States military establishment. And we are now going to see the debate. Well, first, first, let me digress for a moment to show you how this is going to play out and how it's played out over the last three years. There was an interesting front page story in the New York Times Sunday, which began as follows, and it's easy to commit it to memory. It begins, the Reagan administration, comma, Concerned about what it says is an increase in the flow of arms to the Soviet Union from the Soviet Union to Nicaragua, comma, is considering stepped up military activity, etc. Do you realize you have read that same sentence in news stories for the last three years with one change, very significant change? For the last three years, it has been the Reagan administration, comma, Concerned about what it says is an increase in the flow of arms from the Nicaraguans to the Salvadoran rebels, comma, is considering da 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 da. That was the basis of our policy for three years. It was the supposed flow of arms from the Sal Nicaraguans to the Salvadoran guerrillas. As you all know, there was very little evidence supplied of that flow of arms. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you the Nicaraguan government wasn't supplying some or, or weapons weren't coming through Nicaragua to the Salvadoran guerrillas, but never, never, never on the scale that the administration contended, and probably not since 1981, according to David McMichael, the former CIA employee. Nevertheless, that was the basis of the policy. That was the basis of the war. That was the basis of the Contras. That was the justification that, uh, for everything we were doing to destroy Nicaragua. And never floated, as you, read, as you know. Never got very far. The first white paper was, was pretty well se seriously demolished by Jonathan Quitney of the Wall Street Journal, Bob Kaiser at the Washington Post. Then they tried a second white paper, which was supposed to sh so show the, the flow of arms from Nicaragua to the Salvadoran guerrillas. That one was set, such a repeat of the first one that Tom Enders who was the head of the Latin American Bureau at the State Department at the time, didn't even want to issue it. 
in the third white paper making the same, same charges about these flow of arms from Nicaragua to the Salvadoran guerrillas came out in July. That one in 37 pages had 27 references to the New York Times and the Washington Post. I mean, those are the major sources of intelligence for the State Department. You know, we have intelligence agents who say we, you know, we, we have satellites literally that can read the license plate of a moving car going 60 miles an hour. You can, you can go to Fort Meade and at the NSA listening station you can put on, on e these ear things and listen to tank commanders in Iran. As one intelligence agent, agent said, we can hear a toilet flush in Managua. But where's the beef? You know, where's the evidence of all these arms? You know, where's the smoking gun? You may not have found a smoking gun in Watergate, but this is a revolution. This is what this is all about, guns. And the, the evidence was paltry. So now it's shifted. Now the justification for the policy is going to be this massive Soviet arms buildup in Nicaragua. Which came first? The, the bear or the eagle? Who's responsible for the buildup? The debate rages about Cuba, of course. Did, did Castro become, was he a communist or was he forced into the communism in the Soviet camp? by the actions of the United States. I, I don't think that's one that's ever going to be resolved. There's true believers on both sides. But I hope that when the debate starts on Nicaragua, that at a minimum, somebody will read the State Department's own documents, a document that they've done their best not to distribute. This was a report prepared for the State Department commissioned by the State Department. The State Department's not in the habit of having leftists or pro-Soviet individuals prepare reports for them these days. It's called Soviet Attitudes Toward Aid to and Contacts with Central American Revolutionaries. The draft was done in March and then the final one was done in June or July. Interesting what happened between the uh, draft in the final report, the State Department didn't like what was in the uh, first version of the draft and they threatened not to pay the consultant if he didn't change some of the things. <laughs> Nevertheless, let me read you. Soviet military aid to Nicaragua, and I'm quoting, Soviet military aid to Nicaragua is unobtrusive and sometimes ephemeral. All too many U.S. claims have proved hollow talks about in May 1983 when the White House said it had reconnaissance photos proving that two Soviet ships were carrying heavy military equipment. This report says that the ships unloaded only field kitchens from East Germany and 12,000 tons of fertilizer. And then later, the report goes on, President Reagan later declared that another Soviet ship was loaded with weaponry. Yet a respected conservative, Cap C, conservative British observer saw, quote, no sign of offensive weaponry or armored vehicles. You remember the plane that was captured in, in Brazil, supposedly coming, or was coming from Bolivia with arms for Central America, spliced all over the evening news and the front pages of the paper? The equipment on that plane was, quote, defensive and obsolete. The tanks that we've heard about so often, the ominous tanks that the Sandinistas have, quote, limited in quantity and outdated. And here's the sentence I want you most to remember when the debate starts about who started the escalation in Nicaragua. From June 1984, this statement, and the limited amounts of truly modern equipment acquired by the Sandinistas came from Western Europe, not the Eastern Bloc. That, that the Nicaraguans have now turned, the Sandinistas have now turned to the Soviet Union for weapons, anti-aircraft guns, radar stations, and what else they got in this last ship? Well, helicopters, I'm not surprised. They still have the smallest air force in Central America, smaller than the air force of Honduras, smaller than the air force of El Salvador, and smaller than the air force of Guatemala. And it is still essentially a defensive army. And it is facing a war against the greatest military power in the world. Now why are we at war with Nicaragua? 
I submit to you it has nothing to do with national security. Let's make it clear. We absolutely prevent the installation of any Soviet military bases, offensive weapons in Central America, period. But that's not what this policy is all about. If it is, it's a proverbial sledgehammer when they ought to be using a scalpel. The Soviet Union isn't putting, nobody's suggesting seriously that the Soviet Union is putting uh, bases in Nicaragua. And you can't tell me, well, this is prophylactic because someday they might want to establish bases there and we have to stop it now. Well, someday they might want to put them in Mexico and someday they might want to put them in Canada and a whole host of other countries. But you deal with that eventuality when it arises, not in the abstract, not in the theoretical, with a war. As for El Salvador, we have a national security interest in El Salvador, a country, a tiny country. In nine, President Ford's, President Ford's ambassador to El Salvador, a Republican businessman from, from California, said, we have no national interest in El Salvador. And the State Department under President Ford said, we have no security interests in El Salvador. Now, normally, by the way, ambassadors and State Department types are prone to escalate the importance of the countries and the areas that they serve, not to diminish uh, their importance for the national security of the United States. Sea lanes, the argument you hear, we have to protect our sea lanes, that's the exact same argument that Kissinger used when he wanted to send troops into Angola in the 1970s. Angola has been a Marxist state for 10 years and our sea lanes haven't been threatened. Ethiopia has been a Marxist nation for 10 years and our, you know, that's, that's a more uh, geographical interest sitting where it does. Our sea lanes haven't been threatened. Sea traffic hasn't been interrupted. And as one longtime journalist in, in uh, Washington put it, I was on a panel with him, there were three of us, and the journalist on my left made the argument that uh, necessary to protect sea lanes. Before I could respond, the other fellow, I think he's covered Washington for about 20 or 30 years, said, sea lanes argument, he says, that's the biggest canard in, in Washington. He said, when World War III comes, there aren't going to be any sea lanes to fight over. So it's not national security, nor is it democracy, nor is it democracy. If our interests really were in, in establishing, I mean, I wish it were. I wish that's what, what, what our policies were always about, developing democracy. If that's what it was, if that's what it is, why don't we have 10,000 guerrillas paid, trained, and equipped fighting from Peru and Bolivia to get rid of Pinochet in Chile. And we're responsible for Pinochet's existence. And if it's about democracy, why isn't our naval fleet in the Caribbean patrolling and circling Haiti, where Baby Doc is a dictator? And if the policy is really about democracy, how do you explain our support for the government of South Africa, which is hardly a democratic government? I submit to you that what it is is a policy that says there will be no leftist governments in Central America, period. Not by bullets and not by the ballot. And it may be true of any administration. No administration would permit a left-wing government in Central America, and certainly not this one. And if that seems like a statement that's a, a bit brazen and bold, let's look at history. Let's look at the evidence. And I'm not talking about ancient history. I mean, very recent history. 1954 in Guatemala and 1973 in Chile. In Guatemala, a man named Arbenz was elected president. He brought communists into the government. Arbenz was elected in free and fair and democratic elections. And Eisenhower unleashed the CIA and overthrew him. 
And parenthetically, look what we've had in Bolivia for the last 30 years. 1973, Chile. In 70, Salvador Allende was elected president, a Marxist. But he was elected. He didn't come to power with a coup or through force of arms. Salvador Allende was elected in free and fair and democratic elections. And you all know Nixon and Kissinger unleashed the CIA and they got rid of Allende. Now tell me how you can conclude from those two events, in addition to others around the world, in Africa and, and the Dominican Republic and Brazil, but just looking only at, at, at Guatemala and Chile in the last 30 years. That was, that was Eisenhower and, and Nixon. Whatever you think of Eisenhower and Nixon and whatever you think of the Reagan administration, the Reagan administration is more politically conservative. That's not a value judgment, that's an observation. More politically conservative than was were the administrations of Eisenhower and Nixon. And if they would not allow democratically elected leftists to remain in power, how can anyone say that this administration is going to permit the Sandinistas to remain in power? I don't care what the Sandinistas do internally. However democratic the elections might be, the bottom line of the policy is that the Sandinistas have to go. I, w I was recently on a panel with someone from the State Department, and I made that statement. And he got up in his turn and he said, that's, that's simply not true. And he sat down and we were going back and forth and I said, look, and I went through again as I had during my opening statement, I went through again what happened in Guatemala and Chile and I said, now how can you tell me? You, didn't, you know, the United States didn't allow elected leftists to remain in power. How can you give me any assurances that they're going to allow the Sandinistas to remain in power? And there was no response. And the question on all your minds is, are we going to invade to get rid of the Sandinistas? Students always ask that question, of course, because they want to know if they're going to be able to finish their four years or whatever it is. The rest of you ask it as I look at this audience, because fortunately you remember Vietnam. My personal opinion, I don't think they're going to invade. But I underscore that's my personal opinion. I think the war against Nicaragua is going to increase and it's going to intensify. There's going to be a... Contra war is going to continue. I mean, you're going to say, wait a minute, the Congress voted against the funds. First of all, they're going to go back and try to get the funds, but even if they don't, if one looks at the, the history of the CIA and the activities of the CIA under William Casey, I think there's grounds to believe that he'll continue to, to, to fight this war in whatever way. Remember, he's the one who mined the harbors, an act that even Senator Barry Goldwater uh, called an illegal act of war. It's under Casey's, well, he's been the head of the CIA, that the CIA manual, assassination manual, which I'm sure I don't have to explain to this audience, uh, was prepared. Whether he knew about it or it just happened with people under his control, I think, is, is somewhat irrelevant. We could talk for a long time about Casey's activities at the CIA, but, but he's certainly going to continue this war one way or another. And the economic war against Nicaragua is going to increase. And it's going to be stepped up. And they're going to tighten those screws on those people more and more and more. And that people are hurting. Remember, when Nixon went after Chile, he gave the order to the CIA, when he went after Allende, make it scream. That was Nixon's order to the CIA, and that's exactly what the Reagan administration, what the United States is doing to the economy of, of Nicaragua. You've all read the stories and seen the newspaper and seen the television reports about how the Sandinistas are losing popularity and there's dissatisfaction. You bet there is. And that's the exact purpose of the administration's policy, is to fuel that dissatisfaction. Some of the dissatisfaction, make no mistake about it, is the Sandinistas' own doing. But a great deal of it is the design of the Reagan administration and the very purpose of the military and the economic war. There is no toothpaste, there is no toilet paper, there is no soap. 
And in large part, that's exactly what the economic war of that country is designed to do, make it scream. Make the people have to stand in line, and it's only so long that a government can pass the blame to the big uncle to the north. And the dissatisfaction is going to mount, which is exactly what the policy is intended to do. I think before they invade, I mean, I, I, I could be wrong on the invasion. I mean, Admiral LaRouche says, uh, LaRouche says it's coming very soon while Congress is out of session. Maybe. I think they'll do other things first. I think they'll cut off the landing rights for Aero Nika. This is a Nicaraguan airline. Then they'll put on a travel ban. You can't go to Nicaragua like you can't go to Cuba. Parenthetically, so much for our belief that uh, truth will well out in the free, free exchange of ideas in the marketplace. I guess we can't be ex exposed to Nicaragua and, and uh, Cuba and Nicaragua. Might find something there that uh, we could use in the United States. Then they'll probably break diplomatic relations, bring home the ambassador. And somehow, if through all that, the Sandinistas managed to hang on by their fingernails, maybe in 88, maybe then you'd see an invasion, because I don't think this administration is going to leave office with what it perceives to be another Cuba, what it perceives to be another Cuba in this hemisphere. But I think the war is going to continue against the Sandinistas. And in, and in looking at the U.S. policy, I think you have to compare the situation in Nicaragua with the situation in El Salvador. You have to compare the human rights situations in the two countries. You have to compare what the two countries have done for the peasants and the poor of their, of their countries. Now, this isn't an academic comparison. It's not a comparison just for human rights groups. It's a comparison dictated by the policy of the United States the United States policy has been to spend $1.4 billion over the last four or five years propping up a succession, successive governments in El Salvador while trying to overthrow the government of Nicaragua. I submit to you there is more political freedom, more press freedom, more religious freedom, less repression, and a better life for peasants in Nicaragua than there is in El Salvador. Now that again might sound like a pretty bold statement. But let's go through it category by category. Press. And again, this is an important exercise, I think, because of the policy of your government. Press. You've all heard about the press censorship in Nicaragua of La Prensa. You know, as a journalist and as someone who believes in free speech, I, I don't, I don't uh, condone that censorship. I think it's unnecessary. I understand the Sandinistas' arguments why they need to censor the... La Prince, I mean, let me tell you something, La Prince is outrageous in what it prints. It's almost certainly getting funded by the CIA. I mean, La Prince, if you read it, it gives yellow journalism a good name. I mean, it's outrageous. That this, it would probably be censored in the United States. But nevertheless, I mean, I think the Sandinistas, first of all, I don't think that many people read it. And second of all, the Sandinistas have two other newspapers at that, their disposal, and they just ought to let La Prince go. But, but compare it to El Salvador. There's no press censorship in El Salvador. Why? Because there's no press left to censor. The opposition reporters have been murdered and their newspapers bombed into silence. 1980, the editor and photojournalist from La Cronica, small left to center newspaper, were having coffee one afternoon, outdoor cafe, downtown San Salvador, the capital. They were dragged away chopped up with machetes and their body left beside the road. That left one paper opposition voice, El Independiente, publisher Jorge Pinto. Many, many, many threats on Mr. Pinto's life. His office is firebombed repeatedly. January 1981, the tanks once again surrounded his offices. Soldiers once again ransacked it and, and Jorge Pinto left. El Salvador. I, I once asked someone, I asked someone recently, did they think Jorge Pinto would return to El Salvador now that there was uh, quote-unquote democracy? And they said, no, he's just too much of a, a broken man and, and could never return. What's left in El Salvador? Two stridently right-wing newspapers. 
So the fate of the opposition in Nicaragua, censored though it may be, is far better than this fate of opposition journalists in El Salvador. Church. <laughs> I'm not going to get into a long discussion about the church in Nicaragua. Uh, Sister Hartman is here and uh, talk to you for hours about that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a split church in many ways. Uh, many of the priests support the Sandinistas, many of them don't. But the hierarchy is clearly opposed to the Sandinistas, the hierarchy led by, but I underscore the hierarchy. You know, it's, it's not fair to say the church is opposed to the Sandinistas, the hierarchy of the church opposed to the Sandinistas, led by Archbishop Obando y Bravo. And, and the Sandinistas have had fights with Obando y Bravo. And the Sandinistas recently expelled 10 priests. Now, I think that the Sandinistas fighting with the, the hierarchy is pernicious and self-defeating. But again, compare it to El Salvador. The Sandinistas verbally spar with Obando y Bravo. The Salvadoran government murdered Archbishop Oscar Onofo Romero while he was saying Mass. The Sandinistas expelled 10 priests. Salvadoran soldiers raped and murdered four American church women, and Salvadoran soldiers have killed more than 10 priests. Political freedom. Oh, you've heard so much about Arturo Cruz in Nicaragua, the leading anti Sandinista opposition leader, leading, uh, that is, he's the leading opposition leader for the Reagan administration and for many American liberals. There were restrictions on what Arturo Cruz could do. He returned to Nicaragua and he held these rallies and he was chased by these turbas, which are these ugly, ugly gangs of Sandinista youth that wield clubs and sticks and throw stones, bricks, rocks. I think they're ugly and I think the Sandinistas ought to abandon the, 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 these turbas immediately. Compare it to El Salvador. Who's Arturo Cruz's counterpart in El Salvador? It would be Guillermo Ungo, president of the FDR, which, as you know, is the political arm of the revolution. Guillermo Ungo couldn't return to El Salvador prior to the elections of 1982 and 1984 to hold any kind of a rally. And U.S. diplomats in El Salvador knew it because when we would point that out, how can you call these democratic elections, we'd say, when the left can't participate, they'd say, oh, no, the left can participate. They should do so with videotapes from outside the country. <laughs> it was always written that the left boycotted the elections in El Salvador. Nonsense, they boycotted and they could not participate. They were not permitted to participate. And in, in doing my book, I got access to scores and scores and scores of, of classified documents. And in two of them from the embassy in El Salvador, and I must say that the reporting from the embassy in El Salvador for the last five years has been pretty doggone good and the distortions have come in Washington, not, not, from, not from the field officers. Two of those cables reported one said Salvadoran military officers, the senior commanders, said that the FDR could not participate in the elections. And in another meet, in dinner at the ambassador's house, the business leader said the FDR, Ungo Zamora, and the rest of them could not participate in the elections would have been killed anyhow. Remember, November 1980, four days, five days before the nuns were killed, six, five, actually five leaders of the FDR were meeting in a Catholic high school downtown San Salvador. 200 soldiers dressed in plain clothes, of course, surrounded the high school, small unit went inside, grabbed the five leaders and grabbed the sixth man who was a common laborer seeking some religious consultations from the archdiocese, which was on the premises, but mistaken for a leader. The six were taken away, tortured, cut up with machetes, and left beside the lake. And in October 1982, the date's important because that's six months after democracy returned to El Salvador. Four leaders of the MNR, which is a small, small, insignificant, Social Democratic Party operates so far underground that you don't even see it in El Salvador. Four very low-level leaders were killed by one of the death squads. Where is there more political freedom? In Nicaragua, where Cruz is chased and he could have participated in the elections. 
or in El Salvador, where opposition political leaders have been killed. Take the fate of the peasants, the Mosquito Indians. You've all heard about the Sandinistas and their mistreatment of the Mosquito Indians. Have the Sandinistas mistreated the Mosquito Indians? Yes. Yes. But it has not been on the scale in charge by the Reagan administration. They haven't slaughtered an entire culture. They have, there hasn't been genocide. If you'd want to know where there's been genocide and slaughter of a beautiful Indian culture, it's in Guatemala. There, Indian women, pregnant Indian women have had their bellies slit open. Men have had their heads cut off, Indian men, and put on fence posts as a reminder to others, as a warning not to join the guerrillas, not to be sympathetic. Guatemalan Indians, many of them no longer wear the colorful traje, the traditional clothes, because the army all too often is considered any Indian to be sympathetic to the revolution there. You know, we don't hear any outcries out of Washington about that. Genocide, not a word I would use lightly, not a word I would use, but the editor of a, of a right of center newspaper in Guatemala said about a year and a half ago in an editorial two years ago that it was genocide that the army was carrying out against the Indian population in Guatemala. The mosquitoes have fared far better in Nicaragua. The mosquitoes have been moved by the Sandinistas, not into concentration camps. They've been relocated, resettled. I don't, I don't condone that resettlement. But what, what has the Salvadoran army done to peasants who have been living in the zones where the guerrillas have been active in El Salvador? They haven't relocated them. They've just bombed their villages while the people have lived there. According to the latest report by America's Watch, indiscriminate bombing, that's their word, indiscriminate bombing, is a deliberate part of the government policy in El Salvador, the current government policy in El Salvador. According to the State Department's report, the State Department's own report for 1983, every year the State Department puts out a report, Country Human Rights Practices, or Human Rights Practices in Countries Around the World. For 1983, the State Department reported the Sandinistas were responsible for the deaths of 12 civilians. In El Salvador, the number, 140 per month. That means the Salvadoran government was killing 140 times as many people as the Nicaraguan government. President Reagan, as you know, has called Nicaragua a totalitarian dungeon. And recently, the U.S. ambassador, and I have to read you this, the U.S. ambassador to Costa Rica, these are his words. He told a group of Republicans in Charleston, West Virginia, Quote, Nicaragua has become just like an infected piece of meat, attracting these insects, insects from all over. He said that Nicaragua should be viewed by Americans not from the perspective of Vietnam, but from the perspective of Nazi Germany. Well, I ask you, if, if, if Nicaragua is a totalitarian dungeon, and if Nicaragua is an infected piece of meat, and we should view Nicaragua as Nazi Germany. What does that make El Salvador? And what does it say about the policy? Now, some weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a debate, and I ran through this comparison. My opponent got back up afterwards, and he said, the only problem, no, he didn't say it was the only problem. He said the problem with uh, Mr. Bonner's uh, statement and analysis is that he's talking about the history in El Salvador. And that's all in the past. All the killings of the priests and all the killings of the peasants and the killings of the political leaders in the press censorship. That's history. That, that's, that's not El Salvador today. Well, I don't think talking about what's happened in the last three years is history that we should ignore. As the great philosopher Santiana said, he who ignores history is doomed to repeat it. But nevertheless, if, if he insists, and those others insist, let's look at contemporary El Salvador. Let's look at El Salvador under Duarte. 
elected Duarte, and I didn't say democratically elected Duarte. We can talk about the elections if you'd like. Were they democratic? Would they be democratic elections in the United States if the liberal wing of the, of the Democratic Party couldn't participate or the left wing of the Democratic Party couldn't participate? Or the Social Democrats, however small they are, couldn't participate? Would we call the elections democratic? And yet that's a situation in El Salvador. Nobody to the left of the Christian Democrats could participate in those elections. And who interfered with the democratic process? Who subverted democracy in El Salvador? It wasn't the Marxist guerrillas. It was the Reagan administration. After the elections in 1982, Roberto Dalbisan emerged with enough votes to be elected president of El Salvador. Dalbisan, as you all know, is the leader of the extreme right, linked to the death squads. I love that phrase, linked. What a great euphemism. <laughs> According to State Department cables responsible for the assassination of Archbishop Romero, according to State Department cables responsible for the assassination of hundreds and if not thousands of Salvadorans. Yet Dalbisan played in those elections that the United States insisted the Salvadorans hold. The Salvadorans said, we're not ready for elections. The church said they weren't ready for elections. Political parties said they weren't ready for elections. The military said they weren't ready for elections. And the Reagan administration insisted they hold elections. And Dalbisan won. And who blocked Dalbisan from taking power? The Reagan administration. They sent down emissary after emissary after high-level emissary to deliver the message that Dalbisan can't become the president of El Salvador. Among them they sent down was Jim Wright, the House Majority Leader. And, and the same fellow I debated a few weeks ago said, well, that was a bipartisan effort. It doesn't, doesn't impress me that it was bipartisan. It was a bipartisan effort that got us into Vietnam. And in 1984, we took prophylactic measures to make sure that Dao Bison wouldn't win. The CIA spent $2 million in the Salvadoran election of 1984. Now, I ask you, what would have been the response to the Reagan administration if they could have found that the KGB had spent 20 cents in the recent Nicaraguan elections? They've already called them a sham. I don't care what you think of Dalbisan. When we insist that a country hold democratic elections, then I don't think we ought to interfere in those elections. Because we're the ones that are then subverting democracy. But regardless of how Duarte got there, is he in control? No. Now, I like Duarte. And I'm sure I have a debate with some people here who wonder how I can possibly defend Duarte, considering that he's become such an apologist for the military. I like him. I think he's a Democrat with a small D. He may well be a Democrat with a cap D. I think he's decent. Duarte's not the problem in El Salvador. It's the army. And until you understand the army and what it is in El Salvador, you cannot understand the situation there. And until the army is dealt with, which probably means broken and then rebuilt, there will be no democracy in El Salvador. And in my book, I have a chapter called The Army, The Law and Above the Law. Many of my colleagues in El Salvador, including many U.S. diplomats who served there, said you should have written an entire book about the Salvadoran army. I mean, it is an institution that is just all pervasive. And it still controls the country. And we could go through some history how it acquired control in 1932. I think I won't. I've been speaking long enough. 1979, there was a coup, and essentially the army was supposed to give up some power, but the Carter administration, instead of backing the moderates and the civilians, backed the conservatives, and, and the military uh, maintained control, and there have been a few civilians that have had some element of control, but the ultimate power resides in the military, and let me give you the evidence. Not one, 24 hours after Duarte, 24 hours after Duarte sworn in as president of El Salvador, what does he say he's not going to do? He's not going to investigate whether there's a cover-up and the killing of the nuns. Now let me tell you something, there was a cover-up. Judge Tyler, the eminent New York jurist, commissioned by the State Department to conduct a full investigation into the nuns case. 102-page report. 
which the State Department classified as secret, not just confidential, secret for a long time and wouldn't even show to members of the families, of the nuns' families. Judge Tyler concluded unequivocally, beyond any reason of a doubt, that there was a cover-up began the day after the nuns were killed and reached into the highest levels of the military and in his words, Judge Tyler's words, quote, quite probably, close quote, quote, close quote, included Vitas Casanova. And who is Vitas Casanova? He's now Duarte's appointed Minister of Defense. And Duarte says no investigation into whether there was a cover-up. Why? Because the military won't permit it. The military is not going to allow it. Now, 40,000, 50,000 Salvadoran peasants have been killed in the last four or five years, and not one officer, not one soldier, except for the soldiers who killed the American church women, not one has been prosecuted. Is that a country run by a civilian? By the way, in Nicaragua, they have prosecuted some soldiers who have raped, pillaged, and plundered. Not in El Salvador. December 1983, Vice President George Bush went to El Salvador with a list of 24 officers who had the death squads. Military officers. And what's happened? Well, one of them got sent to Europe to a diplomatic post. Nicholas Carranza, in the same debate, a fellow pointed out to me during, you know, pointed out during his opening statement that this was progress in El Salvador because Nicholas Carranza who is uh, head of the death squads, had been sent to a diplomatic post in Europe. 